Park carving a sculpture for the Council on Alcoholism and Drug Abuse, fighting substance abuse here in the community of Santa Barbara. I'm John Fisher. I'm an American sculptor living in Pietra Santa, Italy. And I came here, brought this 19 ton block of Carrara marble, which I picked out in the quarries myself, I put it on a ship, shipped it out of Livorno through the Panama Canal, brought it into Long Beach Harbor and trucked it up here, unloaded it with a crane and set it up. It's a, it's a great project involving the whole community to help build awareness of fighting substance abuse and giving hope to people and hopefully leaving a beautiful sculpture in its place. This is a sculpture of uh, five people. Three people down below in the sculpture are in three different phases of substance abuse. One is completely, hopelessly trapped in their addiction. One is in the process of dialogue, in still in denial but wanting to get free. And, the, and this one here that I'm working on right now is actually getting free, is being pulled up. There are two people up above. One is giving a a helping hand and the other is actually counseling one of the people down below the person who's who's in dialogue so there are five people and uh, they symbolize not only the drug addiction but the people who are working to, to fight it this figure here behind the drill is the figure who is there's the hips, the rib cage, the shoulder, the elbow, arm, hand, the head will be down here, the hand is behind the neck. This is the figure who is completely entrapped in in, in the addiction. It's the loser. It's the one who is bound by the stone of its of the the stone itself represents the addiction. And it's, I'll leave it encased in the stone. So there's no, there's no hope for this person. He's completely uh, trapped. Up here you have the person that's climbing to freedom, climbing to, to a new life. And there you have a knee, thigh, leg, back, shoulder, arm, with the head up there against the sky. That's the figure who's lending a hand and pulling this guy to safety. This is the figure that's climbing to safety. The leg is up here. This is the heel, the foot, the arms reaching out, head, and the figure who's saving him. You have the arm reaching down. He's sitting in a sitting position with the knee up there and the head up on top. side, the head, the elbow, shoulder, torso, knee, heel, foot. This is the person who is in dialogue but still held within the stone of, his, of the addiction. The head, chest, leg, shoulder, elbow, forearm, hand. Here we have the head of the counselor who's leaning over the edge, the sh two shoulders. This hand will be gripping onto this guy's hand. 
and he's this person is saying to this person, look, we're saving your friend, we can save you too. This block was a 19-ton block of Karada marble, which I went up to the quarry and picked out myself. We live in northern Tuscany, in that uh, that's right at the foot of the of the quarries, so it's very accessible for me to go up there. I have a long-standing relationship with the quarry men and uh, the quarry the marble dealers, so they know me. They know the type of stone I like, and we work together. This whole thing is a team effort. Uh, it's not just me carving this, it's the council who's organizing it, fighting back, it's Ealing's Park, it's everybody who working together. My process is one of the most spontaneous of them all because uh, I'm carving without a model. I start by just taking off large sections of stone. One of the way, things I'm always saying is you can't make a mistake if you don't know what you're doing. A lot of people ask, can you take off too much? Something, what if you take off too much? And I say, you can't, because I don't have an idea. I don't know what I'm carving. I have a theme, but I don't have a specific, this is going to be a person here, or that's going to be a person there. I start taking off the stone in an abstract way, making a strong abstract sculpture before I make a figurative sculpture. The, the idea is to get movement in the block. So this block was a rectangle. and What I did was to start taking off stone and making a great abstract sculpture out of it. I wanted movements and counter movements and thrusts and changes of direction, changes of volume to happen so that we lost the, we, we lose that rectangle and get, and get uh, a beautiful abstract. Then that abstract becomes like a big cumulus cloud. And we've all had the, the experience of seeing images in the clouds. And when you see them, you see them because they're mostly there. That's how I work. I make this abstract sculpture. I have all this activity happening, breaks, cuts, slashes. And out of those breaks, cuts, slashes, shadows are created. And those shadows begin to, to suggest shoulders, heads, arms, and legs. And so instead of having to plan something and then take up that model, for instance, and measure and put it into the stone, I just play. I just take the stone off in a wonderful, joyful way and then look into the stone, see my image, and it's right there. All I have to do is release it a little bit more, and it's done. It's very fast, very fluid, and very spontaneous. When I was 12, my family took a year sabbatical. My father's a professor. And we went to Europe in the Middle East. So I was exposed at that young age to all the great masterpieces of art in Paris, Rome, Athens, uh, Beirut, Jerusalem, and uh, Pompeii, Florence. A whole tour of Europe and the Middle East. and. I got the passion. I saw that people had made these wonderful things, and they were just people, and I was just 12 years old. If they could do it, I could do it. And by the end of that year, I had a portfolio bulging with drawings and paintings that I had done on location and entered Claremont High School, which had a very innovative uh, system at the time and allowed students to specialize in whatever field of interest they wanted. Mine was, of course, art, so I took sculpture and painting and printmaking and ceramics and had four years of high school that were just heaven to me. I supported myself with paintings. I cast bronzes. I worked as a blacksmith, a sign painter, uh, did anything artistically I could until one day someone gave me a block of marble. And I carved the first piece of marble and then found a second piece, carved it. And after that, I, I left, uh, I sold everything I had and left for Italy. And I've been there for the last 17 years. I didn't start carving marble until I was 35. But uh, now I'm 53 and it's been great. It's a, it's a long voyage, but a good one. 
the Italians um, say that to carve marble you need three things patience and passion and courage patience because it's a long tedious process passion because you have to be passionate about it to to get to move the stone you have to really hit it you have to desire to get that stone off with all your heart and courage you have to take chances but I add to their three things one more vision you have to see the big picture you have to understand the whole thing in the scheme of art history what you're trying to do where you fit in I love these big pieces of raw stone that remind me of Stonehenge and I love the Renaissance what I'm trying to do is to say something about today using the massive power of Stonehenge and the grace of the Renaissance once I have done my cloud imaging and have found my image there's an important aspect of the, my carving which I'd like to people to understand and that's that I carve only the profile I put my chisel on a profile like my leg from this point of view and I am only carving a line when you're drawing you draw with a pencil and the pencil makes a line but so you don't have to think about line when you're drawing with a pencil because that's the nature of a pencil you have to think about shape shapes of light and dark when you paint you, you paint with a paintbrush the brush as it touches the canvas and lays down that paintbrush automatically makes a shape that's the nature of paintbrushes and canvas so you don't have to think about shape that's the nature of paint you have to think about sculpture you have to lay that paintbrush down on the plane of the thing you're painting you have to think about three dimensions when you paint when you sculpt you do not need to think about three dimensions in volume because that is the nature of three dimensions that is the nature of a sculpture what you have to think about is a line which brings it back to drawing what I'm doing is carving a single line in my cloud imaging when I see my image it I see a profile that profile can be cleaned up can be changed can be modified can be pushed around the corner and I push my profiles this way and I move a little bit and push the profile again push the profile again but each time my decision making mechanism is all about one line at a time it's just between that profile and what's on the other side of it I draw my profile line in my mind and any marble that's on that side of the line is history take it off I move five degrees draw another profile line any marble that's on that side of the line I take it off once I've made it one zero around the sculpture it's finished so when you're carving profile if you if you're carving profile you're looking at the back of the chisel not at the front of the chisel so many people that I see carving carve this way and they look at the front of the chisel they look at the stone they're taking off I carve profile I look behind the chisel and I look at the sculpture the, the stone I'm leaving that's what I'm leaving then after I've taken off the gross amounts I still continue to carve profile but with pneumatic hammers and handheld chisels I go finer and finer details but all the time I'm chasing my profiles around the sculpture around the volume going around my, ch my chisel starts on the profile and slips off behind the sculpture and all the time the stone is flying away from me if you look at the front of the chisel the stone will be flying in your face all day the ancients knew that they didn't have safety goggles so they never would have looked at the front of their chisels or you would have had all blind sculptors they always carved from behind the chisel with a sculpture with a stone flying away after I've done with the chisels there's rafts there's there's pumice stones there's sandpaper all to refine the surface get it down to a smooth surface and close down the crystals get below the bruises so that you have a beautiful as we know them classical finish to this to the marble this is the finest Italian marble in the world with 
tiny, 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 tiny crystals. And you can carve eyelashes with this stuff. Uh, I have 100 year old tools that you use by taking a, a, a stick and you scoot the chisel just with, by a lever action. And that way you can carve tiny details with perfect control. This is an old, old, old technique, but nearly lost today because people don't l know, learn those old techniques anymore. And the masters who use them are almost all dead or in retirement. When I got to Pietra Santa 17 years ago, there were 150 studios and hundreds of artisans. Now there's only maybe 10 studios and but a handful of artisans left. This is a dying trade. It takes all of us to keep the knowledge alive. This is a three-month project and when I'm done here, I'll be going back to Pietra Santa where I have uh, a studio and commissions waiting for me to do. Every so often we we are able to get one of these projects in, in motion. It's an actually long process. It takes a few years to, to get contracts and get everybody on the same page. But uh, I'll be going back to Pietra Santa. I live at uh, in Quechetta, actually, which is right next to Pietra Santa. And you can uh, you can contact me. Uh, my address is five seven seven via Ranocchiaio. R A N O C C H I A I O. Querceta, Q U E R C E T A. In the province of Lucca, Italy. This sculpture is called Vai con Dio, Go with God. And it's about letting our children go. I started it when my daughter Allegra was just born and worked on it off and on for nine years. She actually helped me finish sanding it. And we talked about the fact that she'll probably be the one who sells it. But uh, it's all about letting our children go, giving them the freedom to choose their own direction and take off. So here you have the mother who is giving a final goodbye kiss on the bum, that sweet soft bum and the child already in the process of flying away. This sculpture is titled The Sleeping Angel and I think all of our children when they're sleeping are angels no matter what they're like during the day and uh, I carved this in public at a symposium in a local town, Cerevetsa and I really love it. It was uh, another gift. Some of these sculptures are gifts some you really have to work for, but this one was a gift. This sculpture's name is Solitude. And the interesting story about this one was that um, by chance I met a man, Signor Gentile, who decided he wanted to buy one of my sculptures and chose this one. And when he had made the final payment on it, I asked him where he wanted it delivered. And he said, keep it, sell it again. It's my first benefactor. This is sculpture as a lion, but I call him Azalon from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. And uh, I carved it one winter when, uh, when I was having a difficult winter and, and I asked Azalon to come into the block. I said, I need you, Azalon. Come and help me. And he came. have really developed since, uh, since we filmed last, and this is, uh, this is the figure that's climbing to uh, the new life, free of uh, alcohol and drug abuse. This is the figure who is still in indecision, and you see I, I did find that rope coming down, the rope being offered but not taken. Uh, the counselor uh, up above was offering the rope and, and the advice to the to the person who's in dialogue, um, and then you have on top the man who's uh, giving a hand to this one, and over here on the side the 
the figure of the fallen and defeated. This is already drilled all the way through, so this whole, there'll be a nice little triangle of, of light coming through on, underneath this leg. And all these dark shapes here start to pull off this figure. It's all working. Here you have the wave of the Pacific Ocean, the breaking wave in this natural surface. And that beautiful spiral arching breaking wave. The water, the ocean who turns into the mountain. It's great. Seashells, marble, it all ties together. Santa Barbara. This is an etching that I did, a dry point etching, in honor of this project. I knew it was about lending a hand, and so uh, I did this close-up of hands, two people helping another to safety. Today is Wednesday, the 25th of August, and we have 38 more days to go. Uh, I'm in the second phase of refining the forms down from the basically roughed out form to a more carved form. I'm still going to be leaving uh, passages of break like this. I love those crystals, so I'm not going to finish everything, but where I want to finish, I get that going now. It's been fun. It's been fun. It's been a hot summer, 90 days of work. 
and uh, a lot of fun with friends and new acquaintances, but I'm glad the job is over. This sculpture is one of my uh, river rock series. In Italy there are these marble boulders that roll down the mountain and end up in the riverbed, and I go down and pick them up ten or, t or so at a time, bring them back and carve them. Some of them have defects and get thrown back into the river, but most of them turn into sculptures. So this one was a lion, and uh, it started out, I thought it was going to be a, a female nude, but at a certain point I decided, no, it looks more like a lion. But it's in a position which you don't normally see lions and that's one of the things I like about my process is that you, s you get positions that are unusual and it, it becomes more candid that way as if he was just scratching his shoulder and so heard something coming up and has stopped to, to look and see what it is Quanto è bello, spira tanta sentimento, e come tu chi tieni a me a te, e tiene o cuore un fai tornare. Guarda, guarda, sto giardino, la senti si è si sciurra arrange. We're in Italy and we're we just arrived and we don't speak too much Italian and we walk at home every night our house is up on the hillside and we don't have transportation other than our legs and every house we pass there's a dog and it starts barking and some voice out of the darkness yells Zito we walk a little farther and there's another dog and it's barking and it and the owner says Zito and we think my gosh all the dogs in Italy are named Zito